about for a second the words that we use to talk about our freedom and our competence in the world. We talk about steering, about piloting, about maneuvering difficult decisions, right? Day to day, the way that we're competent, the way that we're independent, is so much about where we are. The metaphor is about where we are and our directional movements. And this has become such an important ethos that I think sometimes we might forget that there really is a system within our brain that is literally devoted to figuring out where we are at every single moment, where our bodies are. You know, the three dimensions of our bodies, of the space around us, and how our bodies interact with that space, even when we're moving and when the environment around us is moving as well. But that system, which involves the right brain, uh, it does involve some other regions as well, but very critically, right brain systems can be impaired. And when it is, we see that our bearings can be devastated. So even such simple tasks as figuring out how to put on makeup or how to shave can become rune-like because the left side of our body, remember this is the right side of the brain that may be more affected when people have this problem, um, the left side of our body becomes inaccessible. We can't shave over there, as you see on, on the left side. Um, a simple task like getting dressed, you know, putting on glasses can become impossible because we just can't navigate even this very small space. Very early in my career, I became very fascinated with this disorder, spatial neglect. All right? And it's defined as a problem with three-dimensional function, all right? this kind of out-of-balance, uh, off-centered performance that causes functional disability and loss of independence. And all through my career, I have really worked hard to understand this, not just personally, but in the research that I do with the Kessler Foundation and with others. Um, and I've tried to understand this not just as a neurologist, but as a poet. That's good, right. So I, I love the way that people, people are like, you know, are you going to recite one of your poems? So having set it up that way, I have to do so. <laughs> Stroke rehabilitation. Show me, I say, my hand making somehow the small performance of a quick freehand outline of the United States. Where is Florida? Make an X. On the slightly enlarged hanging leg I drew for him, my patient indicates correctly. Good. Where is Maine? Texas. California and Oregon, however, sit among their fellows in this man's version, like party guests that bunch around the buffet, like a New York joke, everything East Coast. This cognitive exam's more familiar than my hand that in a harsh morning light suddenly shows age, more familiar than the memory of how so many late nights I longed to escape rooms exactly like this one, staring at the hospital doors, so angry that they opened again and again, but not for me. Now, so willingly, why do I return, sketching my bold lines? Can you mark the middle? What we neglect, I expect we come back to learn. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The young man I wrote about in the poem who had spatial neglect uh, had much bigger problems, of course, than not being able to draw California and Oregon on a map or mark the center of a line. And again, you see this hole in his world, the difficulty with the left side that you saw in the drawings previously and that you saw in the shaving and, and dressing performance. Um, he was unaware of his errors, so there you see that he assessed his performance as good, but not just when he did these kind of paper and pencil tasks, but when he collided with objects when he couldn't finish the food on his plate because he didn't realize you know, the extent, the spatial extent that he's working with when he's doing something simple as eating. Um, when he went to draw or write on a piece of paper, his movements would swerve too far off to the right. And again, he was unaware of this. So this is embarrassing, but more than that, spatial neglect is very dangerous. 
um, because again, you have these um, errors that move too far to one side of space, people's balance is impaired and they have a six and a half times higher risk of falling. All right, every fall, um, potentially an injury and even a fatal injury. Um, they stay in a rehabilitation hospital setting for about 10 days longer than people with a similar severity injury, brain injury, who don't have spatial neglect. And most concerning to me, their caregivers, if they make it home successfully after, you know, after the initial period of care, their caregivers tell us that it takes more than 20 hours a day of supervision time to keep them safe. All right, so this is, this, I mean, for the individuals involved, of course, it's serious in any case. But if it were a small number of individuals, we might feel differently than we do knowing that half of people after stroke are affected by this problem in the first critical weeks and months of recovery. About 30% of people who need to be in the hospital for rehabilitation for traumatic brain injury. So these are hundreds of thousands of people in the US every year affected by this problem. You know, I guess thinking about the caregivers and the period of time that they're spending, these 20 hours a day, more than 20 hours a day, what I wonder about is when are these caregivers able to sleep? Right? This is a problem we need to attack and address. And the, the solution that I'm here to discuss with you is around my neck, and we're passing a few of these around. They're very inexpensive rehabilitation equipment, prism goggles. And what they are are wedge prisms that are wider on one side than the other, and they displace what you see. Um, think about a whirlpool or a machine to magnetically stimulate the brain or electrically stimulate the brain. Or think about even a stationary bicycle for exercise. This is equipment that you'll find in a lot of rehabilitation hospitals, much, much more expensive than this pair of prism goggles. And a therapist can be taught to use these goggles for rehabilitation in about a day. All right, so training time to get people up to speed to use them is not that incredible. Now we're going to see the method that is used for this, and it's going to be demonstrated by my friend Dr. Pei Chen, who's a research scientist at the Kessler Foundation. And she's showing you how, again, our effortless movement system in the right brain um, can guide movements visually um, in the subject there on the right. Um, with the goggles on, what happens, again, because the uh, lenses are thicker on one side than on the other, is that what the person sees is displaced over to one side, and we see that here. So whatever they see is displaced to the right of where it really is. So you see that this person, when she goes to point to the pen, makes an error over to the right side, right? Because that's where her movement system thought that the pen was. Um, but now, without even being instructed, as she continues to make the movement, because of the way that our vision and our movement systems are meant to work together, automatically leftward actions are ramped up so that she becomes accurate again. And the way that we can see that we've ramped up these leftward actions is that when she takes the goggles off, we will see that she has a, a remnant of this leftward action effect. And it's much easier to do this kind of thing than it is to instruct people. So here you see her, she's gonna to point to her midline, and she makes a little bit of a leftward error now. Right? So this is a, a person who's neurotypical, and, but in people who have an injury to the right brain and who have spatial neglect, you'll see that same kind of shifting. And so this hole in space, this area that they're not using, this part of their three-dimensional world that's just inaccessible to them, um, becomes available and they start to direct actions into it. Prism adaptation treatment, um, as is, we realize in the Kessler Foundation, as it has been used all over the world in Switzerland, France, Germany, Italy, Denmark, and Japan, um, involves 10 days of treatment. You just have people do this pointing movement or they can mark a uh, line or they can mark a circle with a pen and it takes about 10 minutes. They don't have to wear the goggles at any other time. And again, a, a therapist can be taught to do this in about a day. They have to do 10 sessions over two weeks of treatment and it fits really nicely into the way that inpatient rehabilitation care is designed. It can be done during a typical therapy session. 
But what's interesting is that, although, as I said, it's being used all over the world, and there are more than 500 studies in the laboratory showing that it improves functional capacity, right, that it helps people. Again, if people are out of balance and likely to fall, it helps them to sit and stand up more straight. It helps them to use a wheelchair more effectively, helps them to dress themselves. Um, more, more than 500 studies in the laboratory and 25 studies that have been uh, systematic clinical trials at this point looking at functional um, improvement. But no other centers are using this in the U.S. except for two other uh, high-profile centers and the centers that we at the Kessler Foundation have trained, so the, the hospitals and rehabilitation places, so fewer than probably about 12 to 15 places at this point in the U.S. And there are hundreds of places, rehabilitation hospitals, regular hospitals, other outpatient facilities where this could be used. But the difficulty, as many of you know, right, is that paradigms of treatment, the way that we do things, moves forward at the speed of trust. People have to take a leap of faith. They have to do something new. And sure, a hospital or an insur insurer will eventually be, I think, convinced when they see fewer falls, shorter length of stay. But we as you know, individuals can also play a role in that kind of advocacy, right, for ourselves, for our loved ones, but even for people that we don't know who have brain injury, because this is something that will really help our society. And the best argument for that is to give you an example of some of the people, one of the people who's received this treatment, and this is Bob, Robert. And on the um, left side there, you see Robert in uh, evidence of his spatial neglect syndrome during the first weeks after his stroke. So he was attempting to draw a clock. And you see that he's not able to use the left side. Robert received the PRISM adaptation as part of his overall rehabilitation program and his ability to dress himself, to care for himself, to, um, to stand, uh, and then to walk with a walker and then to walk independently, all improved. But Robert was then literally restored to the driver's seat. And more importantly, when Robert's parents became ill and needed him to help them, he was able, because he was driving, to take a twice weekly trip from New Jersey to Delaware until they were back on their feet again. So Robert was able to resume not just his basic level independence, but the direction of his life. So inexpensive treatment, effective results. This is a priority I think we can get behind in brain injury rehabilitation. Get things back on a straight path for ourselves and our future. Thank you. <laughs>